quickly changing tact a little bit, I want to quickly mention this. Really interesting article courtesy of Resident Advisor featuring a DJ that I really, really like called Nini H. And what she mentioned here regarding the music industry and just, you know, the money you do and don't make as an artist and stuff is like quite depressing. I'm not going to lie. So this is an article. It's really cool. It says here with the launch of her record label, Ume, um, the Turkish born techno artist commits to teaching emerging pro producers what not to do in the electronic music business, right? There's no official manual for navigating the music business. No wiki how to negotiate a DJ fee or find a booking agent. Though the Turkish born Berlin DJ Nini H early shows might read as a somewhat aspirational CV, including performances at the Berlin Anatole, CTM, DJ Stingray, 313's Night Trezor, her memories of those years are not of a steady ascent to stardom. She says, I always felt like the corner girl. I hadn't found my people yet and I had no one to go to for advice. This narrative may seem incongruous with some people, with someone who's booked more than 150 gigs across five continents since playing her first Berkheim um, club night in July 2019, but Nini H sees this micro misconception as an endemic issue. There's not a, there's not a lot of transparency in the industry. It's something that DJ is striving for to be more of and what's inspired the label what's inspired the launch of a new label and I think this is what I said earlier about the whole like um Michael Bibby thing right and how he kind of brought that guy under his wing and it's kind of you know helping him put his record out and just kind of putting him out there so he can kind of get more gigs maybe get an agent and whatnot we don't really see that too often and it's cool it's kind of interesting to know from somebody that legitimately is kind of like made it in the industry that she didn't also feel like there was that support system or people you could kind of go to for help and advice or for a shoulder to cry on and ear to complain into and now she's kind of trying to fix that issue and i really want to know really why that is the case why is it that in dj world it just doesn't seem to be an area where people either want to like freely give advice freely help um or just be a resource it just seems like people are just locked in doing what they're doing and just continue doing it that way which might explain why as well the genres are so segregated the different scenes right but there's no real kind of overlap between like tech house and techno kind of thing or the house scene is definitely split up usually oddly enough in terms of culture and sometimes race and shit like that may that might be the reason why a lot of it's like that but it's really un it's really unfortunate but let's continue nini h had committed to a life of music for almost 20 years before she played at burkheim at age 11 um she joined the music industry to to join the music academy in the hometown of Izmir and then went on to be a study piano at the Stuttgart State Conservatory. Having becoming a disenfranchised with the white elite confines of the Western classical genre, she eventually moved to Berlin in 2013 to pursue electronic music. The transition from music um, as a creative and academic endeavor to a viable career path was a difficult one and the road paved with trial and error. It was a hustle. I jumped on way too many things that came my way because I didn't know any better, she said. Speaking candidly about her own experiences, uh, something Nini H views as vital to create more open and honest discussions about the nuances of navigating the industry. Over the course of her career, for example, Nini H told me, again, this is, this is the frightening bit about this. Over the course of her career, Nini H told me she's earned a grand total of zero cents in streaming revenue despite having racked up a discography of at least 40 tracks and more than 23,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. No, for real, she laughed. Nothing. That is scary. That is definitely scary. Someone as prominent and what I would say well known, especially within my little niche of dance music and electronic music and whatnot. Maybe some of you guys probably don't know her, but in terms of my little niche of what I know, like she's definitely someone that I would say is well known and definitely on her way for you know legit stardom. To be in a place where you don't make zero money from the music that you produce and that you have online streaming on these living, you know, um, digital streaming platforms is legitimately insane. But it also is somewhat understandable because for whatever reason, there is a real big need for people in dance music to have their tracks signed to a well-known label and i'm sure most of it has to do with just eyes on it and ears on your track and obviously you want to be associated with a legendary record label and whatnot that should be a good that makes a lot more sense yeah big up wade that makes a lot of sense i understand why people are like that but I just feel like nowadays, especially with social media, especially with the internet, especially with all these tools where you can kind of essentially upload your own music to get shared and to get platformed on places like Apple Music and flipping Spotify and whatnot, a tune call, all these things going on. I just don't understand why people are rushing to sign to labels. If they're going to take the majority of your um, monies, if they're not going to pay you, especially in Nini H's case, where she, what she had that issue where she went through with possessions, where they essentially were withholding payment or not paying her at all. Like all those things could be a 
avoid it if you just kind of do it yourself but obviously the do it yourself part of things requires a lot of work and maybe if you're touring and you're out here doing all these different gigs different media obligations and whatnot there isn't the time to really kind of learn and do those kind of things but I feel like that's really the space or the kind of the thing that needs to kind of shift in the scene overall people just need to kind of figure out a solution where they can kind of just release stuff on their own legitimately because I remember reading an article recently where it said um, something like, I don't know what it costs. I think it costs like, a, was it 128 streams to make like $1 or something? Something crazy like that, right? But I think even though that's really low conversion, it should be quite encouraging for people who are independent because it basically means if you do create a little following um, or garner a following of yourself online, you can essentially sustain yourself as an artist, making music just for the people that kind of like, like you and kind of mess with what you do. Of course, it'd be good to kind of get booked in places and kind of be able to go and talk because you can make more, maybe get sponsored by certain people, maybe get labeled to put some money be you know, uh, behind an album or a project or whatnot, or just maybe give you a deal overall. But there is an avenue to actually make a living as a working musician or an artist now with these kind of tools. But obviously, you know, it requires a lot of work to do it on your own. But it's just crazy to think that she's racked zero cents, even though she's got all those flipping listeners. It's absolutely insane. It continues here. Despite the sales and streaming of the electronic music being valued at 1.3 billion, research from the International Music Summit suggests that only 1.2% of electronic music producers are earning a livable wage from it. <laughs> But again, I, I'm going to say the reason why they, this is because the majority of people are signed to labels, personally, production labels, management labels, record labels, like they're signed to somebody's always got their po their hand in their pocket when it comes to musicians, always. Very rarely are people doing stuff on their own. Everyone's kind of, even even me with DJ stuff, you see people all the time with that got, you know, there's this thing that even I'm like, I want to do stuff on my own, but even I'm looking at it thinking, oh my God, I can't wait to get a booking agent because everybody that's a DJ has a thing in their bio, booking agent for Europe, for domestic, for international, different people and shit. It's quite, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's something that you kind of want to have as well because everybody that you kind of look up to has the same thing. But that's also somebody taking money, you know, out of your pocket. And then I'm sure those rec those booking agents are probably linked to press. They're probably linked to labels. So there's this kind of circular thing, which is kind of essentially like a 360 deal where everybody's taking everything out of you in some way, shape or form, which is absolutely wild. It continues. Of this 1.2%, the fraction of producers who are female, non-binary, black, POC, queer or trans is unspecified. But given that it will take an estimated 90 years to achieve a 50-50 parity between the men males um, and the female music producers alone and even longer to producers of color it's reasonable to assume that the number is pitiful it's just one of the ways that the industry's image of success varies from a real life manifestations to me that's where people lose me this sort of stuff like even though i look at it and i can sometimes be like you know a good example being fold right one of my favorite clubs here in london and a place i've been going to since it opened there's not a lot of black djs that play there overall right it doesn't matter to me i don't give a fuck also you know i could say i should be playing there right because i'm an up-and-coming dj i'm somebody that's been a fan of the place for ages i live locally i can maybe say oh yeah because i'm black i should be there also but that's not how life works right you don't get given stuff based on your color and creed and where you're from that really isn't how it should be going and in general when it comes to djing it's already difficult that is is it's super super difficult um especially if you don't produce or whatnot to make it anyway just in terms of getting from like i said it to somebody before like going from playing with the midi player or like messing around with virtual dj in your bedroom to suddenly playing in a massive festival or a massive club or going on a tour there's not really a route a direct route to take you from that to that it doesn't really exist in that regard you kind of have to kind of make up your own way whether it's kind of streaming online making a record joining a collective starting your own nights or maybe doing all of that at the same time there is no kind of one size fits all route to get there some people make it in two years some people make it 11 years 12 years 20 years never it's all kind of up there so if if all those things are already existing as hurdles or as kind of stumbling blocks and as struggles to kind of get there i think adding the extra bit on there of saying you have to be a particular color or creed you have to represent a particular kind of community you have to be a particular type of whatever i just think that just adds unnecessary complexity to the issue that doesn't need to exist if anything all of this stuff should be more on the venues this should be more on the booking agent it shouldn't be on like 
this should be more on them instead of them kind of following the trends and going by based on tickets so this should be more on them to kind of have nights that kind of reflect um you know, to kind of have yeah to kind of have um, lineups that reflect the people that go to their clubs like you know you go to some of these clubs i always mention um i always mention um what's that thing called i mentioned that that flipping really corny edm festival in belgium is a good example what is it called again tomorrowland yeah tomorrowland's a good example every year tomorrowland comes around there's these instagram pages that burst out from nowhere where they feature all these scantily clad girls really cute really hot girls in really tight lycra and spandex and leather and um whatever else harnesses and whatnot you know wearing kind of cute techno outfit whatever edm type of outfits going out there right and having a good time and some of them just go for the clout right they may be just they may be they might even be just only fan girls using those things as a place to kind of promote themselves but i think a lot of girls just go there to kind of you know it's quite fun to dress up and have some fun and you know and basically listen to the favorite DJs that you like to kind of see i'm i'm pretty sure similar like i similar like me like every, most people out there when you start to dj you maybe went to a party for the first time, saw someone that you liked, someone that you didn't like, whatever it may be, and you felt inspired and you went to try it yourself. Um, that's how I did it. I'm pretty sure there are some of those girls who go to those festivals and think, wow, man, this person's amazing. I'd love to be him, right? I'd love to do that. And they feel inspired to also play and maybe, you know, book a session at Pirate Studios or buy a MIDI player so they can DJ. But when's the last time you've seen a Tomorrowland lineup that reflects the people that go to the festival? When have you seen like, you know, a real, you know, decent amount of women on those lineup in general that kind of look like they go to the festivals? It doesn't happen. It's just the same names every single year because those names sell tickets those names are the ones well known so this issue as much as it's important it's also an issue that's kind of more so on the industry itself because they kind of by default just pick the easiest thing and the easiest thing is obviously to you know put a festival on and obviously put a festival on with people that are well known so you can sell tickets and make the money back you invested that makes complete sense but there should be this there should be an understanding that over time especially with electronic music becoming as, as popular as it is now it's becoming legitimately mainstream dance music it definitely is mainstream like you could definitely say there's loads of quote-unquote normies that go to you know underground type events and have a good time i feel like the lineup should be reflecting of that it shouldn't just be like the same people every single year because especially nowadays festival dance are becoming so predictable you can basically guess you know you can basically say the same five to ten names and you could definitely find them across different festivals to different continents it's absolutely crazy so as much as this is important i feel like the main thing should just be like hey let's maybe be clear and maybe give people an idea as to how long and how actually hard it is to take to go from being a midi player person to playing in a festival and let's also put the onus on the clubs and the bookers and whatnot to kind of maybe you know think out of the box and book people a little bit different than usual but you know to say that this should be the the, the prerogative like hey it should be hard coded that you should always have 50 percent this it's just it's just not it's just doesn't it's not sensible because there probably isn't enough there probably isn't a matching amount of women DJs out there to match it 50 50 anyway so by default essentially you'll be raising up people based on their gender who maybe aren't as good as others just because of you know um, how they identify in terms of sex and whatnot gender it just doesn't make sense to me in that regard um, but I do think the problem is kind of layered but it continues in the summer 2022 Nini Hish appeared to be thriving she was playing at least 13 shows a month three or four a weekend but as she reached new heights of her career mentally she hit some of the lowest it was just too much I've been through some very heavy personal stuff but even in the most horrible moments I've always been able to deliver her acclaimed debut album Ali um, a mesmeric inspiration of grief made her far made after her father's death is testament to this fact during this intense period of touring she found herself frequently feeling faint and vomiting i didn't know what was happening i was going back and forth with the doctor but at some point i said to myself this is psychological my ground was shaking i was playing too much this is something you definitely need to hear from people to be fair this is this is the kind of um this is the kind of honesty that people need to hear when it comes to that kind of career because i think on one side even myself it's nice to see or it's kind of a something you want to aspire to when you check out dj on ra and you see the amount of dates they got in like raw man i can't wait until that's me but on the other side of things to go from somebody that's kind of relatively unknown to suddenly going to being a touring person or you're in demand everyone wants you to play at their place every weekend you're you're in one city one day there may 
maybe the same day you go to another city completely it's going to take its toll on you especially if you're not used to it and it's good to kind of have this kind of um honesty out there like and even this line i was playing too much because if for like for someone like myself who hasn't played in a while i'm thinking about it, i'm like there is no such thing as too much but obviously if you go from not playing at all to suddenly playing 150 times in a year it could definitely be too much according to research carried out by the uk charity help musicians nini h experience is no anomaly a staggering 65 percent of people working in music have experienced depression compared to the 15 percent of the wider population and around 70 percent of report anxiety and panic attacks you have all these platforms pressuring you to deliver she explained and it's different from everybody and i want to deliver different things i want to be able to be creative i just don't want to play together with her current booking agent nini h has found a sweet spot a max of eight shows per month wow interesting that kind of goes back to what dixon was doing right dixon when he kind of was reaching the pinnacle of his success i think he's kind of changed his mind now because probably he's a dad and he's just kind of focused on making as much money as possible so he can you know support his family but when there was a time when he was kind of getting voted the top dj of ra where he said he would kind of draw back his gigs i think he was like maximum like 100 gigs a year which is still a lot but i think for most people that were banging it out like that's a sex truck slur at the time and jamie jones when they were blowing they were doing plus 200 you know what i mean even, even someone like a solomon and stuff they were going crazy so the fact that dixon even though he was in demand was purposely pulling back and holding back said a lot and for sure that may be added to his longevity that's probably why he's able to have this like second third fourth fifth wind in his career where he seems to just be getting a bit more popular i would say he's improving you know because i've seen him a lot of times and it's been a bit samey but he's definitely been garnering bigger audiences and crowds overall it's just becoming crazy and crazy maybe it's because of that early time in his career when he kind of could have taken advantage of the the ra best dj in the world kind of poll thing and kind of milked that he purposely sort of retract withdrew and kind of gone in himself and said no i'm going to restrict my gigs i'm going to protect my mental health i'm going to protect my creativity and all that malarkey so that later on i can kind of see the fruits of it and now that he's older he's able just to kind of press the button and go crazy when he wants to and then kind of relax and stuff because i'm sure a lot of djs like do that whole like august thing of going to like um is it bali and places like that in india to kind of you know decompress go to like a silent retreat no phone no whatever but obviously that can help as well it continues as her career was progressed having a team she can trust and communicate openly with has been vital for both her music and for her mental and physical health um it took four years and free booking agents for nini h to find the one julia plash i feel like there was a lot of people behind my back she said um after playing live at Seoul in 2017 a seismic achievement that was permanently tarnished after overhearing a racist remark about her appearance sure in bergheim you know crazy <laughs> holy shit imagine booking a, a set like this and then you're you're like on your highest high and then you hear somebody i don't know what referring to as a kebab or something i don't know what people say over there man but imagine that that must have been horrible nini h has one specific goal to play on the main floor of Berghain, um but for some reason her agent had a different agenda i found out two months later that Berghain had requested me and the booking had been rejected wow this history became the the catalyst for ume um nini, well hold on so did they, i don't understand that her agent re rejected it why because they overheard the racism oh, i don't know okay i don't understand that bit this history became a catalyst of ume nini h's new non-profit record label venture which launches on today on february 15th with maktub the de uh, debut release from turkish german artist bashka convinced as a kind of personal pay it forward scheme with nini h promising no new poc and female lesbian intersex trans anti and agender producer her label will pay artists 100 percent of the profit from record sales alongside providing one-on-one -on -one support and guidance of marginalized artists i don't know how they're going to make money though but that's a fucking noble idea i think i mentioned it beforehand that's really amazing and as you know as layered and as kind of complex as this issue is in general in terms of representation and i feel like a lot of it you can't just kind of force it you know um whatever down people's throats and whatnot or just kind of make it a stipulation of people before they even start and not care about the skill or the ability or their talent or hard work and just kind of you know rely on these labels it is still good to see somebody doing it and putting their money where their mouth is i think i mentioned it before like rago like let me let me try do you know what i mean even though it doesn't seem likely and whatever it may be and the, the cards are stacked against me let me give it a go and see what happens and because you know how this industry is if this works people are going to be copying it do you know what i mean so it just is a a case of just pr of just kind of proving it going into it with an optimistic mindset and hoping it kind of works out 
It says here, I'm at a point in my career where I'm comfortable, she says, Nini H. I want to be there for other marginalized artists who face more issues. I'm not interested in taking 1,000 from an artist who needs it more than me, who has less access to the because who they are and where they are located, who maybe doesn't have a visa to travel gigs. I want to create a platform where people can actually have conversations with the label boss and not have their emails ignored for months. Why are things like that? That's mad, isn't it? Imagine you work all that time, slave over a record, you, you're spamming somebody's inbox you're tagging them in the flipping comments you have handing them flipping usbs after the gig you know they're not gonna listen to they finally listen to it they get you on board you're happy you're hyped and then now you're on the label you're signed you're actually signed to the label you're part of their artist roster you're a colleague you're a employee you're a whatever else in, in it whatever label it is and you send them an email you know just want to shoot the shit and ask a question and they ignore it the music industry is brutal man it's absolutely brutal <laughs> really is brutal like everything you hoped and dreamed for you get there and it just kind of like it's completely different than what you expect it to be uh, it continues there in a traditional label model artists deal with slim profit margins and delayed um play out to the record sales for the f f first the record has to break even nini has explained which means the vinyl is sold out with some additional digital sales on the side then i would say after the couple of years of, it might reach a couple of thousand euros such a return is then typically split 50 50 between the artist and the label but she said it could be three years it could be five Five. so from you making the record to you actually getting money in your pocket for it is five years which is probably why people do i guess this is why probably records should be looked at as like business cards in it they're not really ways to make money they're just a way to kind of there's a there are business cards and cvs you do them to kind of show your work to show your ability or maybe like a portfolio and then you hope that portfolio gets your bookings to play places and then when you get played at, booked at places that money is what you actually make but the idea of like, you know, making money from a hit record, like how dare you as an artist slaving away in the studio expect to get paid for a hit record that you put out? How dare you? You have to wait. <laughs> exactly. So you have to hope you get booked. But imagine if you're a producer that doesn't want to DJ. I'm sure they exist. You have no interest in DJing. You don't even want to perform live. You just like to make exciting tracks, put them out on great labels um, and get them to the people. And, and, and have them do what they want with them, remixes, enjoy them, send you clips of them playing it, whatever it may be, but you have no interest in DJing. You basically have to DJ in order to kind of earn some money or you wait three or four, three to five years, up to you. In her experience, labels often view amounts of money as inconsequential. They don't ever bother paying out. This blatant disregard for and exploitation of artists that comes from ignoring their royalty requests is a situation that prompted Nini H's own public call-out possession base. Yeah, Paris base, um, Paris, sorry, public call out of paris based label possession last year which we haven't seen them again actually since to be honest which is absolutely crazy um ume could be called the membership program but there's a lot there anyway. i'm not gonna read the whole thing but yeah big up nini h regardless the pictures are flipping awesome who took the pictures here um say the pictures does it say does it say photo credit um julian who's that julian tell so big up um nini h for this it looks really cool i love everything about it um what do you call it? Let's see. Let's read the last paragraph. It says, though, um, through her accomplished body of work and unapologetic politics, Nini H not only demonstrates talent but true tenacity and aversion to bullshit. But if there's one thing she wants to put, for, no, she wants for up and coming artists is for them to not be like her. I sucked at making decisions. I don't want anyone else to lose as much as time as I did. I want all queer brown kids to be killing it. Wow, amazing. Love to hear it. Good message, very inspiring. Hopefully we see more of it going forward. And I think that's a Bashka person, right? Yep, so big up them also. Really cool article from RA. If you haven't already checked it out, check it. It says Nina H, her quest to equalize the music industry.